We're going to have today Nick Hunter Jones from Premier Institute. He's going to talk to us about models of quantum complexity growth. All right. Thank you very much, and thank you for the invitation to speak here. Um, I'm actually at uh, Simons, the Simons Institute on campus for the next month. So if anything I say is interesting and you want to chat more, just please reach out because I'm around. Um, good. So I'll be talking about uh, a quantum information result, but uh, I won't assume any familiarity specifically with quantum complexity or kind of the quantum information tools I'll be using. Um, but hopefully the result will still be interesting to those who like to study holography and more generally quantum many body physics. Okay, so I'm going to be talking about quantum complexity. And quantum complexity is a fairly intuitive notion. And specifically, we'll be talking about the complexity of a state or a unitary. And I'll define the complexity of a state and unitary more precisely in a moment. But very roughly, uh, the, uh, let's say, complexity of some unitary, once you fix some gate set G, so I'll just uh, we fix some gate set G and some tolerance. So this is, you know, uh, some set of two local gates, and we fix some tolerance. The complexity of some unitary is just the minimal size circuit, which approximates that unitary to within that tolerance where we build that minimal circuit out of gates drawn from that two local gate set, right? So this is just saying, and yeah, and if we want to talk about the complexity of some state, we also just fix some simple initial state, some simple unentangled initial state, and the complexity of that state is then defined as the minimal size circuit which prepares that state to within, built from that gate set to within the same tolerance, okay? Uh, and in this talk, I'll just be focusing on systems with a finite dimensional Hilbert space. So I'll just say that at uh, all points in this talk, um, we might be considering some d dimensional system, uh, which might be built out of n qubits. And, uh, right. Uh, so I might take the dimension of my. Uh, local system to be uh, some more general number at some later stage in the talk, but for now we'll just talk about multi-qubit systems. And why is complexity interesting? Well, in quantum information, it kind of allows us to distinguish uh, tasks which are computationally easy versus those which are computationally difficult. Okay, so why complexity? So in quantum information, this allows us to distinguish uh, just right, distinguish tasks uh, which are easy versus hard for a quantum computer. Okay. Um, but more recently in quantum antibody physics, uh, the complexity of states has been used to distinguish topological phases of matter. Yeah, please. So for, for a classical computer, uh, the complexity classes are based on ideas of like how a laboratory machine would run? That's right. So I haven't, I'm not really talking about complexity classes here, although the notions are definitely related. In this talk, I'm really just kind of talking about uh, a related, but uh, kind of this circuit model of complexity, where I'm really just understanding how complicated a state or a unitary is by like uh, the minimal way of constructing it. So there are no complexity. Could you say just a little bit more about the relation between these notions, how they're similar and how they're different, or what's the uh, relationship between parallel? Yeah. So I guess I uh, like you could talk about like a, um, given given some task. So uh, given some computational task, which might be you know an algorithm which implements some problem, you could ask how does that how does that uh, or sorry an algorithm which gives you the uh, uh, answer to some decidable problem. You could ask how that output scales with the number of input bits, right? So I might say that you know this circuit depth or circuit size, you know, scales polynomially in the number of input bits, and therefore is like a tractable or BQP problem, you know, a problem that's easy for a quantum computer. So I guess in the specific, I mean, there are many kind of models we have of quantum computation, but in the circuit model. What I mean by distinguishing easy and task is kind of how 
in the case of com like uh, complexity, how it's how the uh, circuit size or depth is scaling with the number of input bits. So if it's scaling exponentially, somehow that's you know something we would consider computationally intractable. But if it's maybe scaling polynomially, you know it's a more tractable problem. The thing that I'm confused by in my mind is something like the halting problem. Yeah. Classically, where um, you just don't know if you're your Turing machine is ever going to stop, right? Yep. Whereas if I ask about unitaries, then so long as I have to find the size of the Hilbert space, there's only so many of them. Yeah, right. So it can't take me forever to simulate one of those simple gates. Yep, that's right. I must be yeah. Thinking so, about that the wrong way, but that's no, the they're just kind of yeah, they're just kind of different questions. I think like uh, I mean, like it's true that classically. Like uh, talking about like quantum mechanically, talking about the complexity of states is kind of a more interesting statement because like uh, you know, like uh, the complexity of some state can be exponential in my degrees of freedom, right? It might take me like a very long time to like get to some state in my Hilbert space, which is you know very far away from some nice ground state. But classically, that's not true, right? I can get to any uh, get to any input like uh, get to any bit string with like at most n operations, but I guess the depth of that, the depth of that, uh, uh, fixing some, uh, yeah, I guess like, uh, so in the classical case, talking about the complexity of states isn't as interesting, but, you know, sounds like the question you're asking is given some problem, you know, how does that depth scale? And you're saying that, you know, it might not, uh, uh, I mean, yeah, it might be like exponential in the number of degrees of freedom. For the specific question that you're asking, there's like a, like a dichotomous, that you have to do first. Because the question of whether or not something halts is uh, <coughs> a side or not. And once only a complexity theory is kind of only relevant before the set of problems that are decided. So if a problem is decidable, then I can figure out how long it will take me to decide it in some abstract formal sense. But the halting problem, we don't even know if it halts at all. So we don't even know if we can determine if it holds at all. So should I think of the preparation of a complex quantum state as just another example of a potentially computationally difficult problem, the same way that traveling salesman problem is difficult? Yeah, it's, it's more like another set of problems that, I, that weren't interesting in the classical case, but which are interesting now. Yes. Thank you. Um, right, but I'm not going to be talking so. Yeah. In this talk, I'm not going to be talking about complexity classes, although they're definitely related notions, but I'm really just talking about kind of the minimal possible such construction of a uh, unitary and uh, of states. Right. So um, this notion of the complexity of states has also come up in condensed matter physics, where the complexity of ground state wave functions has been used to distinguish topological phases of matter at zero temperature. And uh, more recently, in the context of the ADS CFT correspondence, the complexity of a specific CFT state has been conjectured to be dual to the uh, region behind the horizon of ADS black hole. So I'll just say. Um, more specifically, the uh, volume of the uh, uh, of the maximal volume slice anchored at two boundary points in um, uh, for two copies of the CFT um, is conjectured to be dual to the complexity of the time evolved thermofield double state. So, more specifically, the complexity of this evolved <coughs> thermofield double state might be equal to the volume the ADS Schwarzschild black hole, or possibly, I'll write question marks there, the action evaluated on some bulk region called the wheeler dewitt patch. Um, and I'm not going to be talking about ADS CFT in this talk, uh, but I think uh, these are both very interesting proposals, and kind of understanding complexity might, you know, in this sense, tell us more about black hole interiors. But I kind of think that the, the discussion that's taken place in the ADS CFT community can be, is, uh, should, be of much, uh, should be of interest more generally to the quantum many body community. So in this context, it was noted that the interior of an ADS black hole grows linearly in time for an exponentially long time. 
And complexity was conjectured to be the boundary quantity dual to this long time linear growth. But just say that in quantum many body physics, this is probably true much more generally. So if we consider the complexity of some time evolution operator, e to the i h t, it might be true generally that the complexity grows linearly in time for an exponentially long time, saturating at a time scale which is like 2 to the n, or like e to the s. Okay. Uh, so this might be true if you just uh, fix some generic uh, chaotic strongly interacting many body Hamiltonian and try and compute the complexity um, as a function of time. Okay. So there are kind of two features to this plot. You have this, call it a potentially linear growth, some kind of growth in time. Uh, and we kind of know that the depth of the minimal circuit uh, should scale with the time evolution, and we believe that kind of shortcuts should be rare, right? So for at least early time, it should be uh, very unlikely that I'm able to approximate this uh, unitary with like a dramatically shorter circuit, okay? So we roughly expect this quantity to grow, right? And moreover, we also expect that these kind of uh, collisions must uh, must dominate an exponential time scale. So this is saying that complexity must saturate. Okay, at exponential times. And the reason for this was just exactly what Raphael was saying, is that there are only so many unitaries. Right, so uh, we can make this argument for states and unitaries, but obviously uh, if we have uh, a d-dimensional system, the number of states, right, or the number of orthogonal states is obviously d, but the number of nearly orthogonal states is going to be exponent, uh, uh, so the number of orthogonal states is exponential in the number of degrees of freedom, but the number of nearly orthogonal states is going to be doubly exponential. So it's going to be something like uh, e to the e to the n. Or more precisely, if I want to just take the space of states and then like try and just epsilon net the whole thing, so just cover it with like balls of, epsilon, of radius epsilon, what you'll find is that the number of epsilon balls is going to be uh, roughly 1 over epsilon to the 2 to the n. Um, so this is, you know, sorry, yeah. Again, some some sort of seemingly different situation that maybe is not that different. But when you define the complexity, uh, you gave me a gate set. Yep. If you allow me to do anything I want, I mean, so I've got I don't know four different kinds of gates. Yep. And I can combine them in any way. Yep. Uh, and now you're talking about uh, Hamiltonian evolution, which at least when I imagine like a physical system, maybe I discretize it, is kind of the same gate set applied over and over again as I evolve forward in time. Right. Right. Um, so, so, I mean, yeah, so with this. When we say that different paths run into each other, implicitly we have in mind that we could have actually considered different gate sets that end up like producing the same state. Right. Uh, how do we get from one picture to the other? In other words, in this Hamiltonian evolution picture, where do I get the different gate sets? Um, so, uh, I would say that you fix kind of at the beginning, we just fix some different gate, like some specific gate set, and like the ant everything we derive is implicitly going to depend on what that gate set is. So, so we, so we fix that from the outset. To clarify, yeah. Um, but are you? When you specify the gate set, yes. I could, and, and I'm thinking of the circuit as like this is time evolution. I can mock up completely different Hamiltonians. In fact, time dependent Hamiltonians, sure. all sorts of stuff. Sure. But here you seem to be thinking about a fixed Hamiltonian which is producing more and more complex states. Um, so I don't have that kind of freedom anymore. So, well, hold on. So uh, um, uh, I guess like for any, for any unitary, it could be like a circuit. 
It could be some Hamiltonian evolution. It could be some time-dependent Hamiltonian evolution. Like uh, I'm talking about the complexity of that unitary is defined as just the minimal circuit which implements it. Oh, I'm sorry. I right? See. So I'm, I'm, I'm first supposed to use the Hamiltonian just to define the unitary. So you give me, you give me some Hamiltonian. And then I go back. Could be time dependent. You just give me any unitary. And then, uh, but you could even just give me a circuit, right? You might just like hand me some circuit and say, and say ask what the complexity is. And naively, Completely. I could just, yeah, well, I'll just finish the thought. Like I could just count the gates. But the really hard part and the reason proving anything is impossible is because you need to prove you know, even, not, even if you didn't give me a Hamiltonian, but you gave me some circuit, you need to prove that it's the minimal circuit. And that sounds like you need to enumerate all possible circuits. So just, it sounds like proving anything is going to be impossible. Um, because, you know, even if you have some circuit and you say this is the minimal circuit, it sounds like you need to check all, you know, circuits of that size to check that it really is the, the minimal one which implements that unitary. Um, but yeah, we do, we fix some gate set at the beginning and we're talking about uh, the complexity of unitaries, and those unitaries could be circuits themselves, they could be Hamiltonians. Um, and then our task is basically see if we can prove anything. Right. So, good. Uh, so we said there are a doubly exponential number of nearly orthogonal states, and the same kind of counting argument applies for unitaries. So the number of nearly orthogonal unitaries or the, I guess, kind of the number of epsilon balls in the unitary group. Is also roughly one over epsilon. Oh, sorry, I used delta for the tolerance, so I'll use delta. Number of delta balls in the unitary group is like uh, uh, one over delta to the two to the two n. So again, it's doubly exponential. Right, so we have uh, some, you know, roughly there's a continuum of unitaries, but like uh, if we're just restricting ourselves to some tolerance delta, there are like a doubly exponential in the number of degrees of freedom, number of distinct unitaries. Okay, now if we think about uh, the number of circuits we have at exponential times, so we fix some gate set, number of size t circuits. It's going to be, say we fix some gate set and we're just applying you know, gates randomly at every time step. Uh, roughly the cardinality of that set is going to be n to the t, g to the t. And if we're thinking about exponential times, 2 to the n, this is also something which is roughly uh, doubly exponential in the number of degrees of freedom. So at exponential times, you know, kind of the set of all circuits is entirely kind of covered uh, the unitary group. So this is really saying that uh, you know, any unitary can be reached with a, at most like a depth uh, t to the depth t circuit where t is like 2 to the n. So this is kind of an argument that the complexity must saturate at some exponential time. Uh, but this is just some rough counting argument. Okay. Uh, good. So is this clear? Uh, just if, if you're Hamiltonian, let's say, um, I don't know, we've got, a, we've got a grid of degrees of freedom, mm -hmm. and there's neighbor, intera mm -hmm. neighbor interactions, mm -hmm. um, and would it still be, so, so if I now try to mimic the unitary generated by the Hamiltonian with some gate set, uh, can I think of the gate set as acting on any two particles? Even if the yeah, right. Or? Good, good. That's an <laughs> excellent point. Yeah, I should say, uh, uh, ultimately, kind of this choice won't change the answers too much. Um, but uh, in this talk, I'll be focused on kind of mimicking local interactions. So I'll just be choosing a gate set which act kind of on, uh, on you know, I'll kind of be arranging my degrees of freedom in a 1D line and like acting on nearest neighbors. But you might expect that, you know, if I allow kind of all to all interactions, I can get some improvement. So say I, let's, I fix these still to be two local gates, but I can like kind of act on like, you know, very distant. Uh, distant pairs of qubits, um, I might be able to get some improvement. And that's true, but uh, it'll only kind of uh, increase like a scaling in n by like some logarithmic factor. Um, so if you, again, it's just kind of a boundary condition of the setup, or you know, it's just something you uh, choose uh, when you define the problem. But I would say if you allow, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fix to nearest neighbor gates, but if you allow long range gates, some of the factors of n I'll write down might change to log n. 
Sorry, just to confirm what you just said. So you're not doing just general to local gates. You're actually looking at nearest neighbors neighbor. and like yeah. in position space. Yeah, yeah. So I think some of the like I'm actually not going to be too concerned with the some of the scalings in n, but I might have that you know, like uh, some time scale is like going like like uh, maybe complexity <laughs> is scaling like time times n or something, and maybe if you allowed. Uh, very roughly speaking, and I haven't checked this precisely, but it's possible that if you allowed long-range gates, you might bump that down to some log n factor. But so, uh, yeah, I, I would expect that allowing different long-range gate sets is going to change factors of n, but I'm just, in this talk, just going to restrict to nearest neighbor to local gates. So I should probably just write that. Uh, some subset of u4. Uh, and they're going to be nearest neighbor gates. Okay. Um, and I think very generally, like complexity growth for some chaotic Hamiltonian should be a universal aspect of uh, real time dynamics in quantum many body systems. And it's probably related to other things like quantum chaos, scrambling, entanglement growth, thermalization, and transport. And kind of understanding the interplay of all these different features of chaotic systems is maybe like a long-term goal of this subject. But you know, complexity is just kind of one very long-time component to understanding chaotic systems. OK. So our goal is just to prove something about complexity growth. And again, as we said, why is this so difficult? Well, if you give me, uh, if you give me, say, if we're considering some unitary, which is maybe generated by some Hamiltonian, and you give me a circuit and claim it's the minimal size such circuit, like proving that this is the minimal circuit is a very difficult task because it sounds like you have to enumerate all the circuits. Um, so, you know, there are kind of. Uh, uh, yeah, you basically have to lower bound the complexity and prove that there are no shortcuts to like implementing this unitary. So in order to proceed, there are kind of two things to do. One could do. Uh, one could make complexity theoretic assumptions. To make statements about late times. So I'll redraw the Lenny graph. Get complexity and growth in time. Um, and this is what uh, roughly Aronson and Susskind have done to kind of prove stuff about this late time regime. So, you know, they make some assumptions about complexity classes and are able to say that the complexity must necessarily be super exponential at, ex sorry, super polynomial at exponentially long time. So basically this floor is very high. Um, and they can prove that uh, kind of for a fixed Hamiltonian. So another approach, which is one that we'll take, is uh, kind of relax this assumption that we want to understand, you know, maybe a fixed Hamiltonian or fixed evolution and try and understand properties of ensembles. So focus on ensembles of theories. an ensemble of systems. Okay. And then in this context, we'll try and prove a linear growth of complexity. So, right, this is kind of addressing this early time regime. So we'll try and prove something for an ensemble of systems in this kind of, I shouldn't say early time, it's still exponentially long times, but this kind of growth regime. We'll try and prove a linear growth of complexity. In some specific non-holographic model. Okay. And what I mean by ensembles is uh, we're going to look at an ensemble of unitaries. So roughly speaking, an ensemble 
is just a set of things and then a probability measure on that set. So it's just a set of unitaries and then some weights associated to each unitary. Um, so maybe a familiar, and if these are time evolutions, right, these might be like some Hamiltonian evolution. So a familiar ensemble of time evolutions might be evolution by SYK Hamiltonians. <laughs> so perfectly good ensemble of unitaries. Um, yeah? Specifically, you're saying it's an ensemble of unitaries, not of Hamiltonians. Um, right, so I'm actually going to be considering, like, uh, to prove something, I'm not even going to be considering time independent Hamiltonians. I'm going to be considering basically random circuits, which are like a time dependent evolution. Um, but yeah, I want to consider some ensemble, which is like a one parameter family in time. And these unitaries are going to have some time evolution. So, for example, this could be e to the i h t. It could also be some time-dependent Hamiltonian. And what, uh, the model I'm actually going to be considering are random circuits. But for each x i, is yeah. there a restriction on the difference between u of t and u of t plus delta t? In other words, can I get from one unitary to another in very short time? Um, sorry, say it again. So you, you now have a two-parameter family. One is discrete, one is maybe continuous, I'm not sure. Oh, uh, so yeah, I've... In fixed theory, I don't want to be able to, to create you know, very complex unitaries in a short time step. Right, right. So, well, just on the discrete versus continuous, I've written this, I've written this like, as discrete, but one might consider discrete or continuous. Like when we consider SYK Hamiltonians, evolution by SYK is a continuous family of Hamiltonians because we choose the couplings to be random Gaussian numbers and then average over all of them. Uh, I'm actually going to be dis considering, just for simplicity, discrete ensembles, and those are going to be a set of random circuits. Um, but that didn't really address your question. So your question is, uh, uh, for I, I, didn't, I wasn't sure if it mattered well, if it was discrete I, can or I continuous. But Right, right. So actually, yeah, the model we're going to be considering is random circuits, and those are built out of gates, right? But again, and then it seems like complexity is kind of obvious. It just looks like the size of that thing. But the, the challenge there is to prove that some circuit is actually the minimal such circuit, right? right. So if my model of time evolution literally is like this, some, you know, some random circuit where I've done this, like, fine, that's like a depth four circuit. But the, uh, to prove anything about complexity, you need to prove that this was the minimal such circuit, right, that actually implemented this entire unitary. If I fix i, mm -hmm. then the order t means only fix the circuit that I had so far. And, and adding more. Okay. That's right. That's right. That's right. And just like when we, you know, for Hamiltonian evolution, you fix the Hamiltonian and just evolve t later. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. So this is what I mean by like a one parameter family in time. We have like many different instances of the ensemble, but they're kind of growing in time. Uh, good. So we're going to kind of consider the, a very simple model, which is just to try and prove something. And this is going to be 1D random circuits. So we have a system of n. I'm now going to take them to be qubits uh, arranged on a 1D line uh, such that the dimension is a, uh, q to the n. So I'm just, just for convenience going to take the local dimension uh, to be some number I can choose. Okay. And uh, then my ensemble of time evolutions is, uh, oh right, and we fix some And fix some gate set G of nearest neighbor two local gates. Okay. Uh, my ensemble of unitary time evolutions is just going to be the set of all depth T uh, circuits. And yeah, again, this is the model of time evolution. We have this 1D chain of qubits. Like an element of this ensemble, so a fixed I, might look something like this. 
with these nearest neighbor gates kind of drawn randomly. Uh, T is the depth of the circuit, and this width is the number of qubits n. Okay, and again, you know, this looks simple. It looks like, oh, obviously the complexity should just be counting the number of, of unitaries, but again, the, the challenge is proving that that's the minimal such thing, right? I could imagine dropping some gate and then dropping its inverse, uh, and they might cancel. But also, as we said, kind of necessarily, you know, as this depth of the circuit becomes kind of exponential in my degrees of freedom, like I must start getting these collisions and they must start dominating, um, right? So we want to be able to like prove something, you know, kind of at very late times, but before this cutoff. So does the size of your ensemble change as you increase T? Yeah. Yeah, so roughly, right, like if I'm just defining it like this, the cardinality of that ensemble is just going to be n to the t, g to the t, right? Because I just, at every time step, I might choose one, uh, choose one pair of qubits to drop a gate down, and I choose from my gate set. So my ensemble is growing in time. Okay, good. Uh, these random circuits are very nice. Uh, and come up a lot in quantum antibody physics, mostly because we can just compute things really well. They're a nice minimal model of local chaotic dynamics. For example, if you like OTOCs, you can basically compute the OTOC exactly. Um, and that's nice. But you can also compute things like entanglement growth and you know, get a lot of intuition for general features of chaotic systems. So they're nice models. Okay, so hopefully the setup is clear. This is the model we want to consider. And we just want to prove something about complexity growth in this model. Yeah, so this was this relaxation, like uh, relaxation. You know, I can't like uh, it's going to be hard maybe to say about like uh, like writing down the complexity of a fixed element of the ensemble, but maybe we want to understand that like most elements of the ensemble have this complexity. So I won't be able to pick an element of the ensemble and say it has this complexity because it's basically you would collapse hierarchies if you're able to do that's a very hard problem but we will be able to say make statements like you know with high probability an element of this ensemble will have this complexity but if your answer turned out to be not the one you're going to get i think but mm -hmm. that you know the complexity saturates quickly doesn't that just mean that your ensemble is smaller than you thought it was um, so, well, the result I'm going to prove is that, like, uh, is that it is linearly growing, but my results will basically break down at some time. So I'll be able to prove like a linear growth. And basically what you've done then is prove that there aren't collisions. So you've proved that there were kind of no shortcuts. Uh, or at least like basically by considering so that. interpret what you're proving is saying that this, this set E sub T mm -hmm is in fact as large as we think it is at time t. I mean, well, so, but like uh, here large, like they're kind of, you know, this is one definition of large, but then kind of the question we're asking is how many distinct things in, are there in here, right? And that we don't know how large it is. Well, that's what I, I guess what I meant is, sorry. Yeah, yeah. The so number it, of distinct unitaries yep. that are being implemented yep. Is, yep. Is, is as large as that. Basically, yeah, yeah, that's right. Okay. So like, uh, I, I won't even, I won't even be able to prove that, but I'll be able to prove that like, like, uh, you know, it's roughly as large or something. Like, uh, I'll be able to prove that with high probability it has the complexity you expect and that an exponential number. But technically, those don't mean most. Uh, this, those aren't, words aren't the same as most. But yeah, yeah, it's like, you know, this is the naive size of the ensemble, but really what you want to know is how many distinct, like, you know, high complexity elements are in there, right? Because it's, you know, you could, they could all be of giant depth, but if they're all the same unitary approximately, then you, the ensemble is actually really small. I would have said how many distinct unitaries there are in there, which if that's not very many, then they're by definition not very complex. Yeah, that's right. Uh, but like you could imagine like weird pathological examples where I don't know, it's not a priori infeasible that like you know you can prove that they're all very complex, but somehow they're all kind of converging to the same point, which is far from the identity or something, right? It seems unlikely, but at least it's a logical possibility. You kind of like somehow, you know, this is kind of like, we're, like complexity is like a distance from the identity. So I could imagine that all these circuits somehow did something like this, right? Yeah. And it's far away from the identity, but somehow it's, there's only like one of them. But then wouldn't we just say that, you know, for very many time steps, it is in fact growing and then all of a sudden collapses? Yeah, something. I'm just saying this is like, yeah. like I don't know, technically it's a slightly different scenario. But. Yeah, that's exactly right. Good. Uh, 
Right, so just to be precise, I will give, I'll give like a, I gave the intuitive definition of complexity, but I'll just give a more precise one. Uh, uh, so I'll just define the delta unitary complexity of a unitary. To be, again, we fix some gate set. Uh, uh, sub G of two local gates, and then uh, let G sub R denote the set of all size R circuits built from those two local gates. We then say that uh, if there exists some unitary V, which is an element of G sub R, uh, such that our target unitary is close to uh, that unitary V uh, to within operator norm up to some delta, uh, that that unitary has uh, delta complexity of at most R. And then the task is find the minimal such R. So this is just a formal way of writing, kind of the intuitive thing I said before. You're talking one gate per unit. Yeah, I'm actually glossing over this feature, kind of like I'm using results from like a paper I wrote and then also another paper I wrote as well as this paper and kind of what you call depth and size can just depend on, you know, how many gates, but yeah, like a, uh, so I think if, if, if there are factors of n that look different in this talk versus the papers, it, the distinction is exactly that, so size versus depth. Yeah. If you drop one gate per unit time, they will be the same thing, right? Yes. Yeah, and here, here uh, I might actually like uh, I think uh, implicitly I might actually squeeze a bunch of gates into a single time step. So that's again going to change some things by like factors of n, but I won't be too concerned with that. But yeah, roughly uh, depth and r are going to be the same. Sorry, sorry, depth and uh, size are going to be roughly the same thing as r. Um, and actually in this paper, we used a stronger definition of this, of uh, the complexity of a unitary, which depended on kind of an optimal measurement. But kind of this, def this kind of more standard definition is a little easier to work with. All right. Now to proceed, I'm gonna use some results about um, very nice ensembles of unitaries. We're trying to understand the complexity of ensembles of unitaries. And there are these really nice ensembles called unitary K designs. And basically the structure of a design is gonna allow us to prove a lot of things. So a unitary K design is basically just an ensemble of unitaries which look like Haar random unitaries. So again, it's just some ensemble of unitaries which looks Haar random. Okay, more precisely, uh, an exact design, exact K design, is one where kind of uh, the kth moments of that ensemble exactly equal the kth moments of the Haar measure. So this is an average over the ensemble, this is an average over Haar up to the kth moment. And we say something is an exact K design if these two quantities are equal for all operators O. Okay, so roughly this is saying, you know, you should imagine the unitary group is some big space, and we're just saying consider a bunch of points on that space such that when I average over those points, it's exactly equal to the average over the unitary group up to the kth moment. So K is kind of like a knob I can tune which is telling me like, you know, how much randomness of the full unitary group I'm capturing. And we know that these kind of discrete sets exist, but we generally don't really know how to construct them for general K. So I'll say that like, uh, basically we know how to construct K equals one, two, and three designs, but uh, for general K, very little is known. So we can kind of relax this, and we know a lot more about approximate designs. So an approximate design is one where these ensembles are just close.
So an epsilon approximate design is basically one which is uh, close to the hard measure up to the kth moment. Well, this it's kind of like, yeah, you should kind of like, uh, so K, intuitively, K should kind of be like a knob of tuning to go from simple sets to very complicated sets. Somehow like a one design is just like, it's capturing some amount of randomness, but it's pretty simple. So uh, Pauli operators, or like any basis of operators for your Hilbert space, form an exact one design. So this is, if you want to average some quantity involving like two high random unitaries, like, you know, this is averaging over the entire unitary group. It turns out that this is exactly equal to an average over Pauli operators. It's just the statement that basically, you know, this is a first moment calculation and averaging over Pauli's are exactly reproducing first moments. Um, and we kind of know how to, con and you know that these designs must exist for any k, but we only know how to construct them up to k equals three. But we know, we know a lot more about uh, approximate designs. Not, you actually expect also for higher k that even the exact k design corresponds to relatively simple operators. I mean, the complexity grows with k. Yeah. But yeah. Well, so I can prove, like, you know, I can prove abstract statements about k designs and their complexity, and that's what we're about to do. Uh, and whether or not they're approximate is really only just because I'm going to try and connect it to random circuits. Um, but, yeah. Good. Uh, so maybe a little bit more intuition for a design. You could imagine like some time evolution, right? And like kind of asking about the randomness of time evolution at time equals zero, right? So say this is like an ensemble of like Hamiltonian evolutions at some fixed time, right? At time equals zero, you just have a bunch of points at the identity, but like chaotic time evolution or time evolution by a chaotic Hamiltonian is gonna move you like rapidly and ergodically over the unitary group. <laughs> So you might uh, imagine asking, you know, how random your system is by asking, you know, at what times you form K designs. Okay. So, and designs are a very powerful notion in quantum information because they kind of allow you to like wield the power of like fully hard random unitaries with uh, relative simplicity. Um, but for our purposes, they're just very nice ensembles, and we can actually prove things about complexity. So does everyone roughly understand what a, uh, a design is? Are there any questions about it? OK. So one might imagine asking, you know, kind of given this nice, very structured ensemble of unitaries, uh, can we prove anything about the complexity? And the answer is yes. You can actually prove two statements that with high probability, uh, an element like a unitary in a design, so this is a approximate K design, uh, uh, a unitary drawn randomly from a design uh, has complexity nk. And you can prove a slightly stronger statement that uh, an approximate design has an exponential number It's roughly like e to the nk uh, number of distinct uh, unitaries with complexity, this delta unitary complexity nk. And just in case anyone really wants to see the more precise expression uh, with all the factors of epsilon and delta. Um, the statement is that an approximate design uh, contains at least uh, this number
of, uh, of, of distinct unitaries with uh, delta complexity greater than r plus one. But the more intuitive way of saying this is that basically with high probability, a design element has complexity nk, and there are an exponential number of those distinct uh, unitaries. Okay, so again, kind of the statement we've showed is that for this kind of abstract ensemble called the k-design, uh, complexity is scaling linearly in the design order k. Okay. So now if we can prove something about the time evolution and forming designs, then we can prove something about complexity growth. Right? So, you know, look, I'm focusing on random circuits, but more generally you might just ask, you know, like, uh, if any system is forming designs, right? if you can prove something about the design growth, you can then prove something about the complexity growth. Um, maybe I'll actually leave that up there. Just move back to here. So now the natural question is, right, we're trying to prove that uh, random circuits uh, have like a growth, uh, growing complexity. So we can go back to this old result um, by Brandau, Harrow, and Horodetsky from 2012, which says that the set of all of these local random circuits uh, forms an epsilon approximate design. in depth uh, t scaling, uh, I'll just say t greater than some constant uh, k to the 11 and plus log 1 over epsilon. Um, but roughly what this is saying is that these local random circuits form designs when the depth is order n k to the 11. Okay? So this allows us to prove something. So where we've got to now is that we have complexity, which we've sh showed is scaling linearly in k. Right? Now we have that uh, k is related to uh, t to the 1 over 11. So using this result, should say uh, which works up to very high moments, uh, you can prove this kind of very slow complexity growth. Right? So this is kind of like we proved something very slowly growing for an exponential amount of time. But what we really want is a linear growth. Right? <laughs> Sorry, say it again? <laughs> This must be connected to M theory. <laughs> <laughs> you mean why do I have an 11? Yeah. <laughs> it's just like, uh, like uh, it's. I, I would. I, I've definitely. I've simplified this. If you go look in the paper, it's a much more complicated expression. But I would just say that you just, you know, in the proof, you kind of keep like uh, needing to bound some things, and those come with factors of k. So I wouldn't say this is the true thing. And I'm about to say that you can improve on this, but this is just a powerful result that exists. But the 11 just comes from you know, 40 pages of calculations. Right. You get an 11. I don't know. <laughs> there's no deep meaning. I don't think there's any uh, M theory. Well, no, no, no. It's actually, so it's actually like, I mean, this is true, but I think if you actually like plug in numbers into their paper, you might get like 10.5. Oh, OK. So it's not an integer. It doesn't, no, 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 yeah. yeah. But like, for, you know, it's also, obviously, if I make this bigger, the result is also true, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. But 10.5, whatever is the best they can do. Yeah, or then maybe, and then take the ceiling of that thing. So it is an integer because you have an yeah. integer number of layers. But yeah, yeah. I, don't, I don't think there's any M theory popping up in there. <laughs> <laughs> but maybe, maybe, I don't know, you know. <laughs> But like for our purposes, this is 11 is bad because what we really want is something linear. So again, I'll just write it to emphasize: to get a linear growth in complexity, what we really want is a linear growth in design. And if we can prove that, then we've proved a linear complexity growth and kind of verified this some conjectures by Susskind. 
And we'll say that you can do this uh, in a limit. So I'll use, now if we kind of use a more recent result. So this is a paper that I had uh, from last summer. Um, that the that random quantum circuits on on n qubits uh, with local dimension q uh, form designs uh, in depth k designs in depth t equals order n and k, so linearly, in the limit of large local dimension. So for some local dimension q greater than q naught. Okay. So you have to take the local dimension to be large. Okay. And I should also mention that uh, in this paper, they prove that a lower bound on the design depth is known, so it's known to be linear in k. So what this shows is that uh, random quantum circuits are kind of optimal implementations of K designs, kind of you, they're kind of optimal implementations of randomness. And uh, at least in the limit of large local dimension, uh, you form designs as rapidly as possible. Um, so the way you actually do this is it turns out you can write the distance to forming a design as uh, some lattice partition function basically minus the ground state contribution. Uh, and this partition function depends on the kth moment. And it turns out that for the second moment, you can basically compute this partition function exactly. Uh, but for very general k, uh, kind of you know, the decay to forming a design kind of comes from like the excited states in this partition function or domain walls going through your circuit. And you basically just have to bound their contribution. And doing that allows you to extract the design time. Uh, and it's easy to bound the domain wall terms by taking the, the limit of a large local dimension. So basically, the, the way you actually do this is write the distance to forming a design as a partition function, and then take a large Q limit to bound kind of these domain wall terms. And that allows you to prove that random circuits form designs linearly in N and K, albeit in this limit. Okay. So then what we've done is we now have that at least in this very simple model of random circuits at large local dimension, we have that complexity is scaling linearly in K, which scales linearly in T. Right. So what we've done is we've kind of proved this linear growth uh, in complexity for random circuits. Um, good. Uh, and kind of in this paper, like, I think there are a number of reasons why you don't, really don't need to take this large Q limit. So I just basically left it as a conjecture that some of these domain wall terms are bounded in a certain way. And then I think by understanding, kind of by doing some work, hopefully you might be able to drop this large Q limit and then just show that, you know, random circuits like on qubits or something form designs kind of as rapidly as possible. Uh, right, so I'll draw this plot again and just wrap up. So I would say that at least for random circuits, we kind of understand this regime. Let's say roughly we've proved this. Uh, I think we kind of also understand a lot about this very late time regime, uh, both from complexity theoretic assumptions and kind of understanding properties of fully hard random unitaries. But what I really don't understand is like kind of this transition to the plateau regime. Kind of there's a lot of confusion there. So I would say future directions include understanding that transition to the plateau. And maybe much more ambitiously, one could ask, can we prove anything? about the complexity of a fixed Hamiltonian, maybe something like SYK. About the complexity of some fixed Hamiltonian evolution. 
and then, yeah, another future direction is can we relax large Q, this large Q limit? Okay, and that's everything I wanted to say. So thanks for listening. Any questions? Yeah, please. Can you, can you say something about uh, what's the rate that this is growing as well? Is that something possible? Yeah, so uh, I guess you want to understand kind of the constants. Yes. So if I take the derivative of this yeah, growth. The, I mean, I, I know we should not take them seriously. Yeah. Actually, but um, nonetheless, do they scale in an interesting way? Or? Yeah, so, uh, so what kind of dependence? Because I'm going to have some constant factors which just depend on the gate set. Yes. And, you know, like uh, I'm being completely ambivalent about what those constant mm -hmm. factors are, other than I know that they don't scale with like n or t yes. or any of the parameters. Than scaling with n. Yeah, so actually, um, this scaling with n here is going to be, uh, again, this is kind of something that Raphael brought up, but it like, kind of matters how you're defining depth. So if I'm like cramming n gates into a single time step, then that's changing uh, some scaling by factors. And then, then there's a distinction between talking about the size or the depth, because those are a little bit different if I do that. Um, but yeah, in that case, uh, I think if you talk about the depth and I kind of parallelize my circuit, the complexity is going to scale linearly in n. Okay, so it'll be linearly Yeah. But again, uh, as usual, we, we don't really interpret anything that's multiplying too seriously, because it depends uh, on this is, this is This is, I would take seriously. I would not take the constants seriously, because they're just, well, it's just going to be something that depends on my gate set and like kind of all the tolerances I've picked, right? So I have like an epsilon from these things forming designs, and I also have like a delta from, you know, kind of this tolerance for complexity. And if I, you know, kind of tune those in different directions, I can change things. But mm -hmm. fixing those to be some reasonable numbers will just fix some constant. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I'm asking this question more from a biased perspective. Right, because in, in the bulk, yeah, yeah, yeah. There, there are bounds on these things, and I know Which that. I also, I mean, even holography, Okay, but yeah, yeah, like those are, like in principle, if you, you know, like uh, maybe work a little harder and like fix some gate set, you might be able to understand something about the rate of change in time. Mm -hmm. um, but, and I would also say that like, uh, you know, I'm just kind of focus, focused on the simplest example here, which was 1D random circuits, but we kind of, there are other models we know form designs, so if, uh, if you take uh, if you take uh, Hamiltonians and uh, basically uh, disorder average the couplings for maybe like some nearest neighbor terms on qubits and like make those couplings change in time, we kind of know that like those also form designs. So these are like stochastic quantum Hamiltonians or sometimes they're called Brownian circuits. So you, again, you could just throw kind of the same complexity by design result that I had at those systems and prove something about complexity growth there. But roughly, I think that this approach might not, this kind of design approach might not work if you have uh, kind of time independent systems. Because mm -hmm. kind of they move around in like too small of a subspace. So I think it's a good, this is a good approach if you care about, if, if you want to prove stuff about the complexity growth of like time dependent systems. So, you know, maybe something like Brownian SYK. But I think if you really want to fix some Hamiltonian. Uh, or ensemble of Hamiltonians like, and, you know, have them be time independent. Maybe this design approach is not the most feasible. Any other questions? I'm just uh, fascinated by the idea that if you prove anything about the complexity of E to the IHT, so what would the rules be that I, I give you a Hamiltonian for some discrete system of finite fixed size n? Like, it would be amazing to be that you could, for example, prove that there isn't some freak almost recurrent after some amount of time. Or, yeah, so basically, uh, that's what you've kind of proved here, is you've like, uh, and I kind of glossed over the details, but like, um, one way to understand the proof technique, which might be kind of like in the direction you're talking about, is we have this ensemble of random circuits. Yeah. And remember, like, there's all these elements and they have weights, yeah. right? They have some probability that I'm drawing from them. And kind of one way you can think about like, like, uh, bounding the number of collisions in this ensemble is basically by bounding that the kind of value of that weight, because kind of if I have a collision, if like uh, if you know two circuits or two 
time evolutions in this like set of evolutions give me the same unitary, then I can kind of understand that. It's just like uh, some element of that ensemble having higher weight. So one way you prove that there aren't that many collisions is you kind of bound the weights of a design, or but bound thought, the weights. Sorry, but I thought here you don't have an ensemble. Either. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, like uh, I was saying for an ensemble, like that's how you prove things here. If you're now talking about proving anything for a fixed Hamiltonian, that sounds very, very hard, and I have no idea how to proceed. I mean, do you even think that it could possibly be true that there's any general statement about a single fixed Hamiltonian like, like that? Um, I mean, couldn't you always somehow try to fine tune the Hamiltonian in such a way that there's like, you know, some, some secret? Yeah, I think. Uh, yeah, maybe you can like play some game where you write down very. I think like uh, it's going to be impossible to generally like point to any unitary and like uh, be able to write down the complexity because it's just a computationally feasible task. But um, yeah, maybe you could engineer some Hamiltonian where you're able to do something like that and. Like you could also consider like relax, like kind of changing your definition of complexity. So I think Lenny talks a lot about this Nielsen approach. And I think uh, there it's maybe much more feasible to, in this Nielsen geometry picture, compute something like this for a fixed Hamiltonian. Just say something, but I think even in the Nielsen picture, this is in general a very, very hard thing to do, right? Because yeah, I'm trying to argue the answer to this question is obviously no if we don't involve an ensemble effort. Mm -hmm. but I yeah, I actually agree with that. Like, I don't generally. I don't really know how to do anything if I don't ensemble average. Yeah. Certainly, I mean, especially if you want to do very precisely, you're always going to be thinking about geodesics in spaces that have dimensions of like two to the like So this is. But I would like all the kind of systems I understand are all. Uh, like time dependent, so I could even like relax this and say it would be nice to prove anything about an ensemble of Hamiltonians which are time independent. That would also be nice. I don't know how to do that. Okay, so let's pick the <laughs>